Good day. My name is Robert Klar, and I'm a staff engineer at Southwest Research Institute. I'd like to share with you some of the research we're doing currently. The title of this presentation is Using a High Assurance Separation Kernel for Spacecraft Flight Software. I'll talk about why we're doing this, talk a bit about partitioning, and then some discussion of operating systems. And then I'll talk about SEL4, which is a, a microkernel that we're looking into, and talk about some of its main features, its capabilities, kernel objects, and the component framework that goes with it. And then I'll talk about a spacecraft flight system that would be built on SEL4. And then I'll talk about some future work and conclude the talk. Why are we doing this? Well, spacecraft flight software, by its very nature, tends to be a high assurance item. Um, it often is mission critical, security critical, it can be safety critical, particularly in, in manned mission. Along with that level of assurance, it can be expensive. And low cost missions also need some assurance, even though they may not have those types of budgets. Our target small spacecraft, and so here's some examples of some more recent small spacecraft. There's a picture there of the Cygnus spacecraft and a picture of the Punch constellation, which is in work right now. We're looking at partition systems to, to be able to make use of the high performance processors that are now available to us. The traditional approach to doing this is building something called a federated system. And this goes back to the airplane certification, where each line replaceable unit or LRU is certified individually. And this is a lot of the way the supply chain for aircraft was structured. This uh, didn't take into account uh, some of the more modern computing resources that are available that um, can fit in a smaller package and can perform a lot of the functions that are needed. One of the ideas that surfaced from that was the idea of integrated modular avionics. This is a concept that first uh, surfaced in the, uh, the 1990s. It was used to build avionics for some modern aircraft, the Boeing 777, the 787, and also the Airbus A380. What this is, in more general terms, is the idea of having several systems running on the same processing or computing modules. So the more general concept is that of a mixed criticality system. From this initial idea, came out a set, uh, there came a, a set of standards. And uh, an important one of these is A-rank 653 that uh, created some standard interfaces for partitioning these systems. Uh, an initial version was published in, in the 90s, but Modern versions uh, were, were released later. With the release of these standards, several of the product vendors that provide real-time operating systems began offering products to support ARIC 653. Wind River has a version of the XWorks called the XWorks 653. Green Hills has a product uh, based on their integrity op operating system. And likewise, Linux Works and DDCI have products. There's also an open source one called POC or POK. So one of the key concepts here in these A-Rink 653 operating systems is that of time and space partitioning. Now, these aren't really new concepts. Uh, I mean, this is the operating systems themselves were created to be able to share resources for the for computer systems. Unix certainly has user processes with partitioned memory. There are virtual machines and containerization in use now. Uh, these have become mainstream to support the modern cloud computing paradigm. The idea of uh, sharing computing resources in time, time slicing goes back to the days of mainframes. 
what is SEL4? Well, one of the important things about SEL4 is it was the first operating system to achieve a proof of functional correctness using formal methods. This is a very rigorous way of verifying a system. There's an introductory white paper on SEL4, and it describes SEL4 as a minimal core of an OS that reduces the code executing at a higher privilege level to a minimum. So by reducing uh, the code that executes at that higher privilege level, you're maintaining good uh, security principles. It was initially released under an open source license in 2014. There's been additional work besides the, the proof of functional correctness. There's also been some research to prove that uh, compilers produce the correct code when the SEL4 code is compiled and then decompiled to prove that it still fits the original design model. To understand SEL4, I thought it might also be useful to compare SEL4 to a more conventional operating system like Linux. Linux is a, a, a full-featured uh, operating system. By comparison to SEL4, it has a very large kernel. The Linux kernel has uh, steadily grown over time, and there are some estimates that have it as high as uh, 27.8 million lines of code. This is a large contrast to SEL4, which only has about 10,000 lines of code. You've probably heard of SE Linux. Well, SE Linux is not to be confused with SEL4. These are really in security enhancements that have been added to Linux. SEL4 is a bit different in its approach to uh, providing access control and provides very fine-grained control for security. For this reason, it, it, it was uh, embraced by the cybersecurity community. In fact, uh, this is how I discovered it, working with some of my colleagues. Now, Linux has uh, many features built in. It has file systems and virtual file systems and device drivers that are uh, that are loaded into the kernel. And uh, so th these are there's a lot of features in Linux that are, are built into the kernel. There's many distributions of Linux, and uh, a lot of those are uh, what, what is layered on top of the kernel. There are a large body of useful programs uh, because a lot of the, the GNU open source programs have been distributed with Linux. Uh, Linux has been ported to many processor architectures. It has been popular because of its support for so many. The Linux kernel has not been verified formally, and this is where it's quite different than the SEL4 kernel. The SEL4 has gone through proof of functional correctness, and that's one of the, the main uh, reasons for using it. Now, SEL4 can be used as a hypervisor. It also provides some support for virtual machines. Other operating systems can be built on top of SEL4 and make use of the partitioning and the security features that SEL4 can provide. Now, SEL4 is not specifically designed for certified systems, but certainly has gone through a lot of formal verification. That leads into another comparison. Airing 653 was uh, designed for use in these certified systems. A rank 653 standard, it's a very rigid model of how to, to build a certified system. These uh, A rank 653 operating systems also tend to be much smaller than Linux, but they're not on the same level of SEL4 where they lend themselves to verification using formal methods. They do also have some partitioning and security features. So there's a coarse grain security built in. With the different commercial products available, there is also more processor support for these, in particular the PowerPC architecture. So now that we've talked about SDL4 and done some comparisons, we can get into more of the details and how it's constructed. Now, SEL4 is built on uh, 
idea called a capability. It's a capability-based access control model. The capabilities here are more fine-grained than what, uh, if you're familiar with capabilities from Linux on what those provide, in that every service that's provided by the kernel has a capability with rights associated with it in SEL4. As the system is constructed and built up, then uh, those, those capabilities are passed on. There's a definition of capability that describes it as an unforgeable token that references a particular kernel object. Capabilities are stored in something called C slots in the data structure called the C nodes. Capabilities can be copied, moved, and deleted, or modified. They can also be revoked when a, a capability is derived from another capability. Each user space thread has associated with it its own capability space, and this consists of one or more C nodes. Now, there are a small number of objects in the SEL4 kernel itself, and I've listed here some important ones. There are more than these, but these are some of the, the top level ones. C nodes I just talked about, they store the capabilities that are associated with other kernel objects that can be manipulated. There are thread control blocks associated with threads of execution. There are endpoints, and the endpoints are used for inter-process communication. They're used to pass messages between the threads. There's also a signaling mechanism called a notification that works in some ways like a binary semaphore, but it has flags associated with it. There are kernel objects for accessing interrupts and for receiving them and acknowledging them. There are objects for managing virtual address space. This is referred to in SEL4 as vSpace. And then another important object is the untyped object. And this is uh, the mechanism that SEL4 uses for memory allocation to create new objects. This describes a bit more about the untyped object. I wanted to elaborate a bit on that because uh, this is important on how uh, objects are created in SEL4. When you make use of a capability, you make a function call, and this is called an invocation. And an important invocation for the untyped object is this one called SEL4 untyped retype. This can be used to create new capabilities that represent kernel objects of different types and these new capabilities are referred to as children. There's also a, a Boolean flag associated with untyped. Uh, it could be marked as device memory. And device memory is special in that it's, uh, it can't be converted into these other types of kernel objects. It can be retyped as a, a frame object, and that can be used to access registers and so forth. Uh, again, uh, one of the things I mentioned earlier in the description is that in SEL4, the device drivers would be then done in user spaces a bit different than other operating systems. I mentioned also that there's some virtual memory mapping capabilities built into SEL4. They, they, these are very simple set of prim primitives uh, in SEL4 parlance the uh, virtual memory manipulation or the virtual memory objects are referred to as vSpace. And there's some paging structure that's passed to the root task and that, that can be passed to other threads as they're created. One thing to be aware of is because SEL4 is ported to different architectures and different architectures uh, have different ways of managing memory or different memory management units, uh, th this is uh, architecture dependent, so it's different depending on which architecture you use. Another important tool to be used with SEL4 is a component framework. It's called CAMKeys, or Component Architecture for Microkernel-Based Embedded Systems. 
it's used for software development, uh, can be used at runtime. It includes a abstract description language that can be used to define interfaces, components, and really whole systems. And it includes a tool that can uh, combine the auto-generated framework code with uh, programmer code that would make use of the interfaces defined within the component. How are we wanting to make use of SEL4? Well, we're wanting to make use of it in a mixed criticality system where we can partition memory uh, and protect the different parts of the system. The idea is to partition the command and data handling portion of the flight software from guidance, navigation, and control, and then also from payloads. I have a top-level view here of the, the concept for our spacecraft flight system. I'm showing some of the uh, inter-process communication here between the partitions, but not all of the internal communication occurring within the partitions. The green here in the figure represents system software. The microkernel itself is part of the system software. And then there are device drivers, which are built within uh, the user space within these, uh, these partitions. SEL4 has two different scheduling models. They, there is a, a newer scheduler design for mixed criticality systems. And then uh, the, the traditional scheduling within SEL4 can be done on a domain basis. And uh, the domain scheduling in, in uh, many ways resembles the A-Rink 653 uh, time partitioning model where each partition is given, uh, is given a certain amount of time to execute and then uh, it switches to another partition and switches to another partition. And then only when that partition is, uh, is scheduled can the threads within that domain, uh, can, can they execute and uh, uh, go through their cycle. Now, if all of the threads uh, within a particular domain complete, then basically an idle thread executes for the remainder of the time within the domain. Uh, that's the traditional scheduling model. There is a more advanced uh, way of doing scheduling, which involves another object in an SEL4 called a scheduling context. And with that, then you can more finely control budgets for uh, executing particular uh, threads. It's a bit different than the, the 653 model. It's less rigid. So uh, that's uh, another feature that is uh, new. And uh, we would like to look into that idea too for, for scheduling. Uh, now, uh, the other important uh, point I wanted to make on this figure was that, and with this, you could do something like run Linux in, on a virtual machine within its own memory space here. I have a payload partition, which is running Linux and some instrument applications, um, but that is separated from the, the execution of the other tasks that are within the GNC, which is the critical partition and, and the CNDH partition. Likewise, you could have another payload partition running a, a real-time operating system. I'd like to talk about uh, future work. And in the near term, what we're looking to do is implement templates with components for the various memory domains that we described in, in that figure, and also create instances of these templates so that we can conduct verification and testing. In the long term, one of the ideas would be to contribute to the open source project. In particular, um, we would be interested in ports to uh, open power architectures. IBM has opened up the ISA. Another area would be help with verification effort. There's continuous work being done to research and verify. I have a few conclusions. SCL4 is uh, 
a microkernel, it's secure and reliable, it's fast. We do think that it would be beneficial if it had uh, support for more platforms. And although SEL4 has good control, it's still a bit of work to create a properly structured system. Some tools like CamKeys help with this, but we do see that it is suitable for mission critical applications. Last, I wanted to show, I have a few references here, the uh, introductory white paper, and then the SEL4 manual itself. There's also a manual for CamKeys, the component framework. And also on here, I have a link uh, to the SEL4 Foundation webpage where there's a lot of useful resources. Uh, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you.